This week, we are discovering a hidden gem of a red wine found on the Iberian Peninsula in northwestern Spain and in Portugal. And in this week's tip of the week, I'm going to answer the question, why do some wines taste like other fruits and vegetables? I'm about to drop some science on this channel. All of that coming up next. Hello and welcome to Wine This Week with Scott Leake. For the first time since episode two on Albariño, we're back in the area of Galicia in northwestern Spain. More specifically, we're in an area known as Berzo, and this is where Mencia or Menthea is most commonly found. There's about 25,000 acres planted on the Iberian Peninsula, most of it's in Spain, but there is some in Portugal as well. The name itself, I have a little hard time pronouncing. It looks like you would say Mencia, and I've heard it pronounced that way by some Americans on other channels. However, you should pronounce it Menthea. And the reason I have a problem pronouncing it that way isn't because it's challenging to do. It just reminds me of the pretentious Americans who correct me when I say Barcelona and they go, don't you mean Barcelona? No, I mean Barcelona. Anyway, Menthea is a varietal that was once confused for Cab Franc. They even did genetic testing to make sure that it wasn't Cab Franc. So I'm expecting it to have a lot of similar traits to it. I've also had people describe it as being kind of similar to Pinot Noir. So for those of you that either like Cabernet Franc or Pinot Noir, this might be a new one to try. And the great thing about it is this was a overproduced varietal for a long time. And it wasn't until the 1990s, maybe around 2000, that some producers decided, hey, let's take some pride in these. We've got a lot of great old vines that nobody's buying anymore because we've just been producing mass-produced crap. So you've got some, some vintners now who are putting real pride back into this varietal and making excellent quality Menthea. This particular bottle, limited production, this is a 2016 wine enthusiast, you can see their nice little label here, gave it 92 points and this was a $16 bottle of wine. The challenge is it's not super easy to find compared to some other Spanish varietals like Tempranillo, for example. So if you can find it, it should be a good value. I found this online again for $16 and was able to get it shipped for two bucks. So all in, I'm gonna call this an $18 bottle of wine. Let's get to tasting it. Today's wine is the 2016 Lagar de Robla Menthea, product of Spain. 14 and a half alcohol, and as I mentioned, I paid about $18 all in for this wine. Looking at the color, nice. This is, I'm gonna call it a pretty dark ruby color. I can see the lines below my paper fairly well, uh, but it's got a nice kind of inky look to it. See if you guys can get a good look at it there as well. Gorgeous color. On the nose, Okay, <laughs> I got kind of this, now granted I just opened it and I probably should have decanted this a little bit, but I got this like kind of yeasty doughy smell right away, which is probably not supposed to be there. Opening up a little, there's some, a little floweriness to it, maybe violets. And this is more on the darker fruit side of things. So depending on the climate, the particular slopes, this is a very large area within Spain where this is grown. So there's a lot of different things that can impact how each producer's wine turns out. This I'm getting more dark fruits instead of lighter fruits. I've seen it described as it can be kind of like a, a Pinot where there's maybe sour cherries, some pomegranate. This to me is more Definitely more of a dark fruit. And I'm certainly getting some alcohol in the nose too, which I'm not particularly enjoying. It's not terrible, but like, maybe my nose is just sensitive today, who knows, barometric pressure or something, I don't know. There's some cedar, um, I don't know for sure. I tried to find out if this had oak exposure and I don't know that there is any, but I'm getting kind of some cedar notes that maybe this had some some oak exposure. All right, let's get to tasting it. It's fairly dry. There's no sweetness to it. It's a dry wine. I'm getting some berry flavors though. The acidities 
I'm gonna go medium high on the acidity and medium on the tannin. So they're in decent balance together. There's just the, this really fine kind of sandpaper feel on my tongue. I'm not feeling it as much in my gums. It's not, it's not drying it out too much. It's a little bit more of a juicy kind of refreshing style of wine. So for a day like today where it's 93 degrees outside, this is a good wine. I can see myself sitting, sipping this while I'm, while I'm grilling tonight. The alcohol, not quite as bad going down as I imagined it would be based on what I was smelling. I was getting a little bit of heat and I can still kind of feel it now, but it's not too bad. At 14 and a half, it, it's, it's about what I would have expected. So I'm gonna call it medium high on the alcohol as well. And yeah, the flavor intensity, I'm gonna put that kind of right at medium as well. It's a little bit lighter on the flavor intensity than I you know, would like, but for what it is, you know, it's pretty good. There is some minerality coming through and that could be that some of the soil where this is made has some slate to it. It grows in slate, it grows in clay soil. So again, depending on the producer where their vines are, that can impact some of those components, but I'm getting some minerality in here. Flavor's starting to emerge, starting to get somewhere. I'm definitely getting some blueberry now, which is one of my favorite components to get on a red wine. Maybe a little blackberry, some dark plum. There's a little pepperiness and a little earthiness as well. So yeah, this is starting to, starting to break out a little bit. Again, just opened it. I'm gonna give this a pause and we're gonna come back in just a few minutes and see with a little decanting and some aeration how much this changes. All right, so the wine's been decanted. I let it rest for 10, 15 minutes. We're gonna give it a try now, and we're also gonna give it a try in a Pinot Noir glass. The wine's been compared to Pinot in some ways, and I just thought, you know, maybe to get some more of the aromas to come out, I'd use the larger bowl and see if that makes any difference, who knows. Well, right off the bat, I like the color even better. It's, it's more, more ruby, less of the purple. Not surprising given the volume and shape of the glass. All right, we're getting a little bit more going on, uh, on on the aromas. I still get that cedar right off the bat, but I'm also getting some of those black fruits, black plum, even blackberry. There's some earthiness and pepperiness coming through now as well. Let's taste it. This is an old world wine. So if you don't really like French wines, Italian wines, Spanish wines. Yeah, don't bother. But if you like some of that old world style where fruit bomb just in your face isn't the first thing you get, you do get cedar first on this, but it is backed by some nice dark fruits. There is that earthiness. There's some pepperiness. Yeah, this is a good, just kind of classic old world wine for 18 bucks. Wine enthusiasts gave this 92 points. I'm not, I'm not quite getting that, uh, but it's a good wine. On my scale, my 10 point scale with five kind of being good, medium average wine, 10 being the best wine in my life. Everything's in pretty good balance. You've got some primary, secondary, and tertiary notes uh, with the fruits, with the cedar, with the earthiness. I mean, it is five years old. This is supposed to be really good, consumed young, and I'm curious what a 2018 or 2019 of this would taste like. Maybe I just waited too long to have this one. Length, that could be a little bit better. I'm not gonna give it a ton of points for the length on the finish. The intensity of the flavors, kind of middle of the road, but you know what, that's okay. Everything doesn't have to just knock you out with its intensity. So for everything that there is in this wine, given its body, its acid, its tannin, I think an overly intense wine would have made this feel a little more out of balance. And as far as the complexity goes, there is a fair amount going on. It's a little subtle and you have to, again, kind of like old world wines, 
all in, I'm gonna call this six points on my 10 point scale. So above average, good. You gotta know what you're getting into and, and like this style of old world wine to appreciate this. But I do like the acidity. I like this does have kind of that juicy, vibrant, refreshing quality as well, which isn't always congruent with old world wines. It makes it kind of its own. Yeah, I, I think this will be good tonight. I'm I'm having I'm taking a little bit of risk here. I'm having fillets grilled but in cast iron. So I think because the fat levels are a little lower, based on where the tannin level is with this and the fruit should work okay. Having some um, you know grilled mushrooms and onions with this as well that should bring out more of that earthiness, but hopefully highlight uh, and bring some forth some of the fruit as well. But let's spend a little time going into why this wine has some of the traits that it has. What is it that makes a grape not taste like a grape anymore and taste like so many other things when it becomes wine? Well, to answer that, we're gonna have to talk a little science. So safety first. All right, I probably don't actually need the safety goggles to talk about this. We're gonna talk a little organic chemistry and I am gonna do my best to keep this fairly short and interesting. But I wanna say first to all of you who majored in organic chemistry in college, number one, this might be old news for you, so feel free to skip ahead. But number two, I apologize for making fun of you for taking organic chemistry. For those of you who didn't take it, like me, there's a little science behind why a Cabernet, for example, tastes like blackberries and tastes like earth and tastes like green bell pepper. Why are these flavors in a wine that is supposedly made just from grapes? We didn't actually put those other flavors in there, so how'd they get there? Well, let's first talk about what a grapevine is. It is a plant, and like all living things, it's trying to do a couple things, stay alive and procreate and make more of itself. So what does it do? It produces flowers, flowers get pollinated, flowers turn to fruit, fruit gets eaten by other animals, animals then take those seeds, doesn't digest them, passes them through, drops them off somewhere else in the world, and a new grapevine grows. That's really what all this is about. So when that grape is growing, when you've, if you've ever had the opportunity to eat a grape before it's ready, if you have a red grape before it actually turns red, it's hard, it's green, it is unbelievably acidic, the tannins are gross, and it might taste green to you. It might taste like green bell pepper or tomato leaf. And those are some flavor pro profiles that do appear sometimes in a Cabernet that is under ripe, that if the grapes were picked too soon, or if it was a vintage that was too cold and they just couldn't get ripe enough. Because in order for a grape to really thrive and taste great, it's got to have its sugar level rise, which needs to happen through sunlight and overall growth of the plant. So as that sugar level rises, there's an inverse relationship where the acid level is gonna fall. But there's a chemical compound inside some grapes, particularly Cabernet, called methy, methoxypyrazines. So methoxypyrazines will actually decrease in intensity as well, along with the acid level as the sugar rises. By having that in there, it is another kind of anti-feeder for birds and other animals that until that grape is ripe enough, when its seeds are fully mature, that it is then appetizing for the plant or for the animals because the plant doesn't want those seeds consumed until they're ready to go off somewhere and be able to be planted. So that's why it has that green flavor to some Cabernet. Now, that flavor really isn't there. If you were to eat a mostly ripe or fully ripe grape, you're still not gonna taste the MPs in there. What you're gonna taste though comes about after the interaction of yeast with the grape and the sugar in the process of fermentation. So that is going to create certain chemical reactions that release the MP compounds and might bring it about in a wine. There are plenty of other compounds that are present as well. So there are compounds called esters and esters are gonna bring about some of those fruit flavors. There are uh, aldehydes, there are terpenes, there are all, there's like a dozen plus different compounds that are present in grapes and there's all kinds of subcompounds within each of those categories that might be present in 
a Riesling that is not present in a Sauvignon Blanc, that's not present in a Merlot. So each varietal has different chemical compounds and different types of yeast can have different impacts on how those flavors emerge once they're brought together and once fermentation happens. So I wanna give you just kind of a basic level because I have had this question asked of me of, of how is it we get these fruit flavors, these vegetal flavors, all these other things in something that just comes from grapes when we're not actually adding those things to it. If you wanna know more, go ahead and ask your doctor to open up her organic chemistry textbook and give you a refresher on it. Otherwise, just take it for what it is and keep enjoying good wines. Thank you for watching another episode of Wine This Week. Join me next week as we move on to a fantastic varietal from Italy known as Montepulciano. Another fun one to say, as are all Italian wines. Until then, keep trying new wines, and as always, cheers. Cheers.